FGE is leading a consulting group focusing on the oil and gas markets east of Suez, Europe, and the United States, with office in London, Singapore, Dubai, Hawaii, Beijing, Yokohama, and Perth. Dr. Fesharaki work is well recognized worldwide for a pioneering oil and gas market Anal analysis and studies of the Asia Pacific Middle East energy market since the early 1980s. He was born in Iran. He received a PhD in economics from the University of Surrey in England. He then completed a visiting fellowship at Harvard University Center, uh, Univers University Center for Middle Eastern Studies. In the 70s, he attended the OPEC Ministerial Conference in his capacity as energy advisor to the Prime Minister of Iran. Having joined the East-West Center in 79, he currently he is currently a senior fellow and leads the energy-related research. In addition, Dr. Fashraki is the author of more than 100 papers and has authored and edited every over 30 books and monographs. In 89, Dr. Fashraki was elected as a member of the Council of Foreign Relationship in New York. Since 91, he, he has been a member of the International Advisory Board of JX Holding, Japan's largest oil company. Dr. Fashraki was in 1993 president of the International Association for energy economics, the key professional organization representing over 3,900 energy economists in more than 85 countries. In 1995, Dr. Fischrocki was elected as a senior fellow of the U.S. Association for Energy Economics for distinguished service in the field of energy economics. In 2002, Dr. Fischrocki was appointed the senior associate of the Center for Strategic and International Study, or CSIS, in Washington, D.C. In 2008, Dr. Fischrocki was appointed a member of the National Petroleum Council by the U.S. Secretary of Energy, Samuel W. Boltman, and was reappointed by current U.S. Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, in 2010. And since 2009, Dr. Fischrocki has served as a member of Dubai Mercantile Ex Exchange Limited Board of Directors. I know most of you know Dr. Fischrocki, but I insisted to read his CV as long as it is. So we're very honored to have him here. And please join me to welcome Dr. Petra. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Sami, uh, distinguished uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor and privilege to be here. I have had a chance to come to Indonesia now for 30 years. Uh, I've had a chance to know many of you. Uh, Bakshuta was a teenager when I came here first time. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Sobotlo was a young man, a young professor, uh, getting ready to become a minister. So, long time, many memories, and seeing uh, a lot of changes. And uh, having become often personally and emotionally involved in all the uh, changes in Indonesia, some good ones and not, some not so good ones. <laughs> so, uh, today, I will follow a new policy, I will not show you any charts, I will give you a story of my thoughts about the international market and try to relate it to some of the situation in Indonesia and what it means for us in the near future. Among the key messages I wanted to give you is one important conclusion. That conclusion is that we believe that over the next few years the price of oil will come down substantially. By substantially, I mean $20, $30 a barrel to something like about $80 per barrel, sometimes around 2015, 16. And uh, that comes from a variety of reasons. Uh, the supply side is growing very well. The demand side is doing okay, but not as fast as the supply side. Today, the growth of liquid production in the United States, Canada, and Iraq are about 1.2 million barrels per day. The global oil demand is only about 800,000 barrels per day. Now we heard from Bill the fantastic story of the Chinese demand growth, and uh, obviously China's demand growth will become slower as time goes by, but the absolute numbers are still quite uh, spectacular. So why is the demand not going to grow as fast as the supply? is because uh, we expect the United States to lose huge amounts of demand in the gasoline consumption with efficiency standards, which President Obama put in place during the bailout of Detroit. 
numbers are quite spectacular. You can lose 1.7, 1.8 million barrels per day in the next six or seven years of gasoline demand, and one and a half to two million barrels per day thereafter. So what China gains, U.S. loses. Almost the same, not quite exactly the same, but similar. So please think of U.S. as a fat child losing weight, and China as a thin child gaining weight. But some of the speed is about the same. So a lot of the growth gets negated by the losses in the United States while the liquid production goes up. What is the implication of $80 oil? Well, if you produce conventional oil today, anywhere in the world, or Indonesia, you would be pretty okay at $80 a barrel. However, if you want to do mergers and acquisitions these days, you have to be a lot more careful about what you buy. High oil prices makes everybody happy in the oil industry. You can make any purchase, any good or bad decision, still it ends up to be good. High oil prices make you successful no matter what. So if you're clever, you can make a lot of money. If you're not clever, you can still make a lot of money. <laughs> but when the prices come to about $80 a barrel, you have to get extra clever. You have to be very careful about what you do. And if you go outside of the oil sector, then the challenges become very large. If you are in the gas sector, the energy sector, you have to be extra careful. Many of the folks who develop the big LNG projects in Australia, if they knew the price of oil would end up paying $80, and the cost of uh, construction of their liquefied natural gas facilities go up by 30%, they might not be considered. So you get different kind of dynamics coming in. If you want to develop expensive projects on gas, be it the browse in Australia, or Alaska, North Slope, or Natuna. The price of oil is $80. You have to be extra careful. Very hard to make the only case for some of these projects. So, our view is that anybody who wants to look at the future needs to be sure that their projects are robust at $80 and not count on the high oil prices to take care of themselves. If the price of oil goes up to $200 a barrel, and that would come from, say, a revolution in Saudi Arabia, I think the uh, American Marines may be on the way to make sure that things are put back in order. So there are limits to the structure and what the world can tolerate in the volatility in the price of oil. With that, I think we can look at the world of $80 base case, probably a little bit lower, as a low case, but it can go much lower than that. I think I want to emphasize this. That it's very hard to see a world where the prices go below $70 because a lot of non-conventional oil will go out of business. Anything around $65 a barrel would shut down many production around the world. So the world of $80, I think, is a world that a lot of people can live by, but it makes investment decisions much more subject to scrutiny and uh, division compared to the past. There is also another interesting development. Uh, when it comes to the gas business, so often uh, they ask the question, well, what about the projects in, us, in, in, in Indonesia with all the volumes of LNG which are going to come from US and Canada? Actually, if the price of oil is $80, $85, the price of gas is the same whether you bring it from the United States to the Asian market or whether you based on a up based pricing or whether you follow oil indexation. So at $80 a barrel, oil indexation and up pricing is about the same. There is a rule that I want to present to you and that's called the rule of 12. You can't bring gas from the US or from anywhere else to the Asian market at less than $12 a million BTU. Often, the uh, question is asked in Indonesia, what should be the right level of price for natural gas, which would still give encouragement to the producers to produce gas, and also gives encouragement to the consumers to be able to afford it? Of course, 
This is an old debate, not just in Indonesia, but around the world. But my recommendation is follow the $12 rule. You have a $12 rule, you can make it possible for the projects to be developed, and you can make it possible for those who need it. Consume it. If you go less than $12, you end up killing the supply, and if you have price of more than $80, that's what it decreased to you anyway. So there is a divine ethic intervention that the prices of $12 will be to you will become a global standard, not at the, best, at the point of export, but at the destination level for many of the uh, buyers. And this gives us the chance to be able to think through the decisions that we want to make, both in terms of the domestic prices and in terms of the global prices. Other groups which are affected by the potentially lower price of oil are all of the renewable energy world. The renewable energy world today still has to be subsidized at the price of $100, $105 a barrel. If they go down to $80, the subsidy needs to be more. Yes, technological breakthroughs will come. But as of now, based on what we know, lower oil prices also makes life very difficult for uh, renewable energy. And some certain efficiency measures will also face the same problems. So in the new world, the new world defined by uh, what we heard, the shale gas revolution in the US, all the changes which are coming, is not only in shale gas, but also in other things. The United States, by 2015, will produce more liquid from shale and high oil than the oil production of Kuwait. Hmm. By 2020, more than Kuwait and Abu Dhabi combined. These are all very dramatic changes. But the interesting point I wanted to share with you is that the growth of production in the U.S. and the lower imports doesn't mean the U.S. will import less oil from the Middle East. Indeed, we expect the imports of oil in the United States from the Middle East to go up, not down. The casualty is African exports. Pretty much all exports from Africa to the United States will be eliminated. But the Middle East crude, which is the crude that Asian wants, also will be very important in the U.S. Why? Because these liquids are very light. And the U.S. has the most sophisticated refining capacity in the world. 50% of the cooking capacity of the world is the United States. So heavy crudes are needed to be blended into the lighter grades for feed refineries. At the same time, countries like Venezuela are diverting huge amounts of oil out of Venezuela and out of the American continent into Asia. Between India and China, we expect a million barrels per day of Venezuelan crude to be consumed in short order. Already last year, almost 500,000 barrels per day of supply contracts were signed between the Venezuelans and Indian buyers. So the dependence of the U.S. on the Middle East will not go away, but the structure changes in a big way. The U.S. will export LNG. The exports from the LNG, U.S. LNG will be substantial. I expect somewhere around minimum of 40, but more probably 60 to 70 million tons of LNG coming from the U.S. to be followed by about 30, 40 million tons from Canada and up to 50 million tons from Mozambique. So the world of LNG will be a very, very dynamic world. A lot of LNG on the market. Does a lot of LNG mean that the price of LNG or gas will go down? The answer is no. The only way the price of gas will go down is the price of oil will go down. And with that, we believe that there is $80 floor or $12 a million BTU floor, which we face everyone. This is the first time I think we have a credible floor for the price of gas that we can base decisions on. Now for Indonesia, as the world number one LNG exporter for a long time, 
now falling behind still, there are substantial prospects for additional energy exports, not only from the deep water, from uh, Tango Train 3, from the Abadi project, from the additional gas production that's been going to the liquefaction trade which are sitting idle. There are great prospects still ahead. The glory of the old days of Indonesia being number one, well, that is gone. That's not going to come back. But there is still life in the Indonesian energy export market. For years, rivalry between institutions in Indonesia created confusion in the market. People used to know Pertamina as the big energy exporter. And then it became PT Index. Now, I think it's very positive development that SKK Vegas and Pertamina working closely together to create the Indonesian brand and Indonesian image, which is something which was tarnished by lack of ability to deliver and by rivalry. I take this as a good omen and a positive note that while the global market is going to see a lot of energy, still I am convinced there is substantial room for marketing of gas out of Indonesia to the Asian markets and with the prices moderating room to get a compromise between the international price and domestic price for gas, something that everyone can live with and something which gives proper incentives for investment in Indonesia. Thank you very much for your kind attention.